The Lord is here. Let's pray. Lord, may your word be our rule, and may your Holy Spirit be our teacher this morning, and may your greater glory be our supreme concern. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, In our scripture today, and for those of you who can, you may want to have it in front of you, um, Ezekiel 37, which is what uh, Ian read, verses 1 to 14. And in this scripture, uh, it's a famous scripture, we're given an image of bones scattered across a valley. It's a vision given by God to the prophet Ezekiel to show him something about the future in a visual way. The Lord doesn't just tell Ezekiel about the future. The Lord shows him. And perhaps you've had someone in the past, I know I have, someone trying to explain something to you. You may be in a woodwork shop at school. You may be, you know, uh, training as a doctor. Someone's trying to explain something to you. And then you sort of understand it. But then the person explaining it to you says, look, look, I'll show you. It, it may be in the kitchen. You're trying to teach them to do something. You're trying to show them something. And then, then you get it. You see and you get it. And you say, look, I see what you mean. And there is a saying, isn't there, that we, we say a picture paints a thousand words. And except in this case, what the Lord shows Ezekiel is more like a video. This vision is more like a video. And the details of what he saw in that video, if you like, if we call it that, is recorded by Ezekiel for us today. Which means that it's relevant for us today. And relevant to all generations of believers because it has significant meaning for us as the people of God. It shows us about the future. And it tells us about God's character, his power and his great love. So we start with Ezekiel The scripture says he's being set down in the middle of a valley. Because it's a valley, there are either hills or mountains on either side. And Ezekiel looks and wherever he looks, it just seems there are bones lying on the surface of the valley floor, wherever he looks. The Lord, it says here, Verse 2, leads him back and forth among them, among the bones. And still in verse 2, it says, bones and more bones. In verse 2 again, Ezekiel saw a great many bones. In fact, the scripture says that the valley was, quote, in verse 1, Full of bones. It's not my words. It says here, the valley was, quote, full of bones. This is the scripture. So, we need to understand this is not just like a few bones that we might see when we're watching a, you know, a a David Attenborough program where a a half-eaten animal is, there's a few bones left, or we might come across some bones in a field or something like that. It's not a few bones from a single animal that, say, had died, a a cow or a sheep or a deer or a goat, it says the valley was full of bones. A valley, not a field. It's not a back garden or that kind of plot. It's like a a valley. And Ezekiel saw that the bones were dry. Verse 2, we read the bones that were very dry. That's what the scripture says. It's an emphasis on they were very dry. And, you know, we know what, what, what happens when a bone is exposed to the sun and the outside air. After a while, there's no trace of flesh on it, is there? The tendons connecting the bones weaken, decompose and disappear. 
And all that is left is a dry bone. So what does it mean for Ezekiel to see all these all these dry bones fill in the valley? And the first thing it means is that it has been a long time since there was any life there. It's been a long time since there was any life in that valley. The days of life are long gone. And over time, over many seasons, with wind and rain exposed to nature, the bones may not even be in any order. Sometimes they find in, a, in an old burial site, bones neatly arranged because the person died where they were, they're buried underground, the bones haven't moved. There's no sense of that here. The bones, there's no evidence that the bones are in any order whatsoever. What does it mean to see all these dry bones? It means that at some time in the past, there used to be life in this place. But now everywhere Ezekiel turns his eyes, there's a picture of death. What does it mean to see these dry bones on the ground and not in the ground? What does it mean to have them on the ground and not in the ground? It means that when death came, there wasn't any burial that took place. There wasn't any dignity for what used to be living. It isn't how any of us, is it, would like to happen to our physical bodies when we pass from this life to the next. That's why we use the expression, don't we? Uh, we talk about a decent burial. And families fight so hard to retrieve the remains of a relative, no matter what's happened to them. Perhaps a relative who's perhaps died in a war. So that they can honour their memory with what we call a decent burial or a cremation. To mark their passing, to remember their life. And it says here, as Ezekiel looked, the Lord led me back and forth among these bones. Verse 2. Surely there was no way of even telling which bones belonged together as we said, let alone who the bones belonged to. It was a scene of devastation. It was a scene of desolation. Had there been a massacre? Was it a famine? Was it a plague? If it had been a famine, then surely as people died, surely they would have been buried. The weakest and the vulnerable would die first, but others would be available to give them a decent burial. The same with a plague. But the sheer number of bones on the valley floor suggested that there had been no one to bury anyone. It suggested that a disaster had come suddenly and had impacted everybody at once. Whatever had happened, it seemed to have been a sudden disaster. Now, remember that while Ezekiel is given this vision by God, he's in Babylon with the Israelite people that have been taken into captivity when Israel was invaded. Many, many Israelites had been killed by the Babylonians. When the Babylonians conquered Israel, when God had removed his protection from his people because they had abandoned him. And made themselves vulnerable. And Ezekiel is living among those who survived in Babylon. Removed some 400, 450 miles away from their homeland. So that's the context of the vision. And in the vision, the Lord asks Ezekiel. He says, son of man, he says. Verse 3 says, 
Can these bones live? How do you answer that? Naturally speaking, the answer is, naturally speaking, the answer is no. How can they? But this is the Lord asking the question. Ezekiel knows that God is all-powerful, but as a human being, he's never seen such a thing. And he answers the only way he can. He's a sovereign Lord, he says. You alone know. And Ezekiel leaves open the possibility that such a thing could happen because God can do anything. And he knows that. He knows that God is the creator who's put the universe in place. And it was, quote, from Genesis 2 verse 7, it was the Lord who formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. That's a quote from scripture, Genesis 2 verse 7. Ezekiel knows this. Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And in Ezekiel's vision, the Lord then instructs Ezekiel to prophesy to these bones that littered the valley. Dry bones, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord. So he's telling Ezekiel to speak the words. Rather than the Lord speaking the words himself, he says, Ezekiel, you prophesy to the bones. Say, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. And he instructs Ezekiel to speak his words, the Lord's words, his words, to the dry bones. And it's God who will make the dead bones come to life. But he will do it through Ezekiel. And although this is a vision... We find here a characteristic of the Lord our God. He wants to involve us, his people, those who believe, in fulfilling his purposes here on earth. And of course, we, we cannot do anything without him, without faith. We cannot achieve his purposes in our own strength. The sooner we realise that, the better. We need his power, but he will use us if we're willing to speak his words, to fulfill his purposes. And today, the church is the body of Christ here on earth, equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill God's purposes here on earth. The Lord continues telling Ezekiel what to prophesy to these dry bones. Verse 6, I will attach tendons to you. I will make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then, then you will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel then records for us to read today that he prophesied as he was commanded. The word is commanded, verse 7. The word is commanded. So often we soften that from the Lord into a polite request. But he's the Lord. And when he says something, it's a command. We need to take it as something stronger than a polite request for our own benefit. Mm -hmm. And so often the temptation in the church is to speak things that the Lord has not commanded. And the outcome is that God's people then move away from the truth of God's word. Because of so many times 
People have spoken in the name of God things that he hasn't said, things that he hasn't commanded. Verse 7, so I prophesied, said Ezekiel, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling noise, and the bones came together, bone to bone. This is his vision. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on the bones, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Why didn't the Lord do it all at once? Why do we have the bones coming together first, rattling, then the tendons, then the flesh appearing on the bones, and then the skin covering everything? Why didn't he do it all at once? Why not skip the steps? He's God after all. Why not skip the steps and create a body from the bones in a single act, with breath in it? And we'll come on to that. Verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these bones? No, breathe into these slain that they might live. Verse 9. And here we have more information, we have a clue to what happened that led to all these bones being left on the valley floor, unburied. Breathe into these slain. In our language today we don't use the word slain so much. A modern translation might translate it in... Breathe into these that have been killed. The original word also means slaughtered, put to death, murdered, destroyed. That's what's happened to these people. And Ezekiel is being shown by the Lord in this vision that the bones are the result of a slaughter, a mass killing. Not from famine, not from a plague. The dry bones that fill the valley are the result of enemy attack who destroyed a people. Verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, says Ezekiel, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet A vast army. This is the word of scripture. A vast army. Verse 10. The dry bones were not of animals. They were human. What was dead has come to life. And it is a vast army that is now standing on their feet. Not a few hundred. Not a few thousand. But a vast army number filling the valley and it is the Lord's doing Ezekiel has spoken the words that the Lord has commanded him to speak but it's the Lord's doing you know the Apostle Peter uh, he writes to us in his letter 1 Peter 4 verse 11 if anyone speaks they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. And although it's a different context, the same principle applies. If you're representing the Lord, you cannot speak what he hasn't spoken. On the other hand, if the Lord has spoken, you need to deliver it. And even if it's unpopular, you need to deliver it if the Lord has spoken. It's a command. And Jonah, as we know, he ran away because he didn't want to deliver God's words to the city of Nineveh. So he ran in the opposite direction. He believed that if he did 
speak the Lord's words to the city of Nineveh, it wouldn't go down well. And that's why those who speak for God are tempted to declare only those things which people want to hear. And in Jonah's case, he discovered, of course, that you can't, you cannot run from God. There's nowhere to hide from him. And he eventually went and, as we know, he delivered God's words to the city of Nineveh. And it led to an an outstanding outcome. An astounding outcome. A city of 120,000 people, the scripture says, that was heading for destruction, was saved. Because Jonah was obedient. It was saved because the people, including the king, listened, were convicted and acted on the words of God through Jonah, a man. And here, Ezekiel, in the vision God has given him, has spoken God's word to the dry bones. And the whole people were restored. And the Lord continues to speak to Ezekiel and explains more of the vision. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, the people of Israel, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off, verse 11. Well, hang on a minute. These bones are the people of Israel, says the Lord. Well, that makes sense. Because the people have been brought back from the dead. Breath entered them, it says here. They came to life and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. We understand that. But then we have, the people of Israel say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. So how can the people who are dead speak about their bones dried up and their hope gone? We are cut off, they say. And this is where we realise that although the bones represent death and destruction, the dry bones also represent the death and destruction of people's hopes. The dry bones that filled the valley represent not just devastation and desolation of a people that have been defeated. They represent the devastated hopes which leave people desolate. There's a bleakness when hope dies. Our hope is gone. We are cut off. Verse 11. You know, and for many people whose hope has gone... Who feel cut off. It feels like a death inside. Some of you may have experienced something of this. Even though they're still living. Something inside feels that it's died. Going through the motions of life. But hope has long gone. You know, the songwriter James Taylor has a line in one of his songs. Living in silent desperation. Everything you hoped for has evaporated. And it's killed something in your heart. And yet, in the Lord, there is always, always hope for those who believe. Shattered dreams, broken hopes... We can bring them before the Lord. Can these bones live? The Lord is asking Ezekiel, can they? Sovereign Lord, he says, verse 3 says, you alone know. And the Lord invites us to believe. Can these dead, dry bones live? Are we prepared to believe when your landscape is littered with disappointments? The Lord invites you that, to believe that he, only he, can bring life from death. 
Do we dare to have hope? And it depends who's offering. What if, what if the God of hope is offering? And in Romans 15 verse 13, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at large, to us, may the God of hope, he's the God of hope. These people's hope is gone. We're cut off, it says. But he's the God of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So that you may overflow with what? With hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what God's people have to offer. Ordinary as we are, the Lord is in you and me. That's what we offer. And it's not us offering, we, the Lord is using us to offer where his hands and feet with the body of Christ. If the pilot light of hope has gone out in your life, it may have gone out recently or it may have gone out a long time ago, many years ago. Only the God of hope can relight it. And the Lord invites us to believe. And he's asking, can these bones live? It's a challenge. It's a loving challenge to faith. What do you think, Ezekiel? What do you think, church? The church of today, of 2024. Can these bones live? And you might say, because it's you, Lord, I'd love to say yes. But help my unbelief. I struggle to believe sometimes. And the Lord instructs us to speak life over what seems dead. To speak life over what seems hopeless in our situations. Prophesy to these bones, the Lord tells Ezekiel. And you might say, but Chris, I, I'm not Ezekiel. I'm not a prophet. And yet the Lord wants us to speak his words of life over dead and hopeless situations in our lives today. In Acts chapter 2 verse 17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And in verse 18, the very next verse, he says, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And brothers and sisters, let me remind you this morning that we live in the last days according to Scripture. The Apostle Paul writes into the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, he says. I would like every one of you to, he says. But I would rather, he said, I'd rather have you prophesy. I'm not a prophet, Chris, you might say. But the Lord is giving us words to speak life over dead and impossible situations. Ordinary as we are. The world may speak death, or at best, it may speak a false hope to us. We, those who believe, are called to speak life. Using the words that the Lord gives us, not our own. Using the words of the one who gives life in abundance, that's him. The Lord Jesus says in John 10 verse 10, he says, I've come so that they may have life. And have it more abundantly. And if we are God's people, by default, we are people of hope. If you meet a believer who's not hopeful, something's wrong. Something needs to be put right in their understanding of, of our Lord and their relationship to him. In Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 he says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. 
That's what happens. We have an increased strength when we place our faith in and our hope in the Lord. We find our strength ebbing away when our hope suddenly, subtly over a period of time, because we might be very capable in some areas of life, some areas of our work, we start to put our hope in ourselves and we start to lose our strength. But he says those who hope in the Lord, if we correct ourselves, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. You know, when we find our strength ebbing sometimes, it's a good place to look. Where's my, where's my hope being placed? It's shifted. It used to be on the Lord more. But in the spectrum, it's moved over here more to me. It's not going to get us very far. The hope that we have in the Lord is resurrection life with him. His life in us. That even though we die, we live because he lives. Death has lost its sting. Because Christ has overcome death on the cross on our behalf. And until we come to Christ, we are helpless and hopeless. But he's faithful, as we know, to forgive our sins when we turn from them. And to give us a hope, that word hope again, and a future, when we believe and trust in him. We may have had our hope cut off before, but our hope is restored. We no longer stay in the grave. He's risen, are the words we declare, especially at Easter. And we are risen too. And the nation of Israel was restored, as Ezekiel prophesied. After 70 years in a foreign land, the people were given permission by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, to return to their homeland. The city of Jerusalem was rebuilt. The temple was rebuilt. And the people had a renewed hope for a future with the Lord. And the Lord says, therefore prophesy, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and I'm going to bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when, when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you. There's the prophecy the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land Ezekiel's prophecy is on more than one level it's for Israel and it's for the city of Zion the heavenly city that we're all heading to for those who believe then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I've done it, declares the Lord. Let's finish with this. The resurrection hope belongs to us all, every one of us, who are yearning and longing for the Lord to fulfil his promise to his people. The time that is coming when we will be with God in the new Jerusalem, as the scripture describes it, the city of God forever. That's our resurrection hope. Dead bones. Can they live? Yes, they can. In God. We need the Lord. And that's the hope that we offer the world that we're living in, ordinary as we are. We need to arise and shine. God's light has come through us. It's his treasure in the clay jars that we are. Be convinced, uh, people of the church, that we have something to offer the people around us. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord. That dead bones can live when you're involved. You, the author of life, who gives life. You, O oh Lord Jesus, that lays down his life only to take it up again. Because you've been given authority to do that. Lord, help us to be a people who speak life over others. Who speak life, not death in the situations we find ourselves in, at work, 
within our families. Lord, it's so easy to stay in a hopeless situation. Lord Jesus, help us to dare to believe that the impossible for us, what is for us impossible, is possible for you. May, Lord, we live with a resurrection hope among the people of this land, this town, this area of Fife. May we shine for you and point towards you. In Jesus' name, amen.